Well, hello, this is Dr. Antherica Lane, and this is Conversations with Dr. Lane. I'm so excited today to have three chaplains from the Jewish Hospital Mercy Health, which is a part of Bond Secures. First, I have Chaplain Dr. Lachelle Edmerson. Good morning. Next, I have Chaplain Reverend Dave Ebacher. Good morning. And next, I have Rabbi Chaplain Elena Stein. Hi, everybody. It is such a pleasure to have you all here today. As you know, we are currently in the midst of a COVID-19 pandemic. I thought it would be an excellent time to discuss the spiritual impact of a pandemic such as COVID-19. So it's such a pleasure to have the opportunity to talk with all of you. Chaplain Dave, how did the COVID-19 pandemic change the way that you ministered to your patients? <laughs> That's a great question. Uh, rather dramatically. Um, um, well, I want to first say every hospital system has its protocols, and then, of course, that goes down to the, the local hospitals, and so uh, each hospital really has its own, um, has its, its own uh, guidelines for, for practicing um, spiritual care, and uh, at the Jewish hospital at this time, we're doing it by, by telephone, remotely, um, and uh, um, this uh, presents some challenges because, uh, uh, as we have shared in, in doing our spiritual care uh, assessments, um, part of our assessments we use is uh, like say nonverbal communication. And um, when you when one does spiritual care by phone, you're simply missing that altogether. So uh, the communication by phone is then a uh, then focuses on say the inflections uh, and the tonality of the patient you know comes into a, a sharper view as we try to do this by phone um, and supporting the patient we're, we're we're listening to these things and and trying to uh, um, you know carry a conversation by phone. Um, uh, is is and make it as meaningful as possible for the patient, and, and as we try to extend that sense of of spirit and and care for the patient by phone, uh, by a device, uh, as opposed to being in person at the bedside. Um, so uh, we we still try to do the best we can. Um, there there uh, some of uh, some of some of, the, some of the things we're trying to implement now is is the use of I uh, got iPad um, uh, some tech, some additional technology to help us so we could uh, maybe do uh, some kind of FaceTime if you will uh, to to add video um, to uh, our visitations um, uh, but we have yet to uh, have that fully implemented so uh, um, something I look forward to. Um, I think we all look forward to them in some ways. Uh, and so, um, uh, and this also is a challenge to provide care for the staff. Uh, we are uh, calling uh, our, our units. Um, uh, the way we are, our schedules have, have shifted quite a bit in, uh, in contrast to what our schedules are like in hospital. Um, so, but one of the things we try to do even from a distance by phone is to uh, care for the hospital by calling up on the units, um, asking if, you know, general questions, if there's any specific patient needs, and then um, if there's any staff needs. And sometimes uh, when we either speak to the HUCs, uh, the unit coordinators, or um, a nurse, or even a charge nurse or a nurse supervisor or manager for that matter, we will spend, uh, try to seek a little extra time in, 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 our, in conversation to find out, you know, how are they really doing uh, up, uh, on their floors and what is the sense of morale? Uh, and then we take that information back uh, to, 
to our meetings uh, and see what we can do as a team to help facilitate uh, care to these units uh, as we learn by phone what their what their needs might be. Uh, so we, we are, I think we are doing the very best we can by phone. Um, but, uh, but it has been a, a, a transition for us. I can speak to myself. It's been somewhat frustrating um, because I, I've learned I've learned out of this experience that how much I I rely on nonverbals uh, as uh, Chaplain Michelle shared earlier. You know, part of the assessing is the the room itself, and we're not able to see the room, and we're not able to really see the patient. Uh, we can only hear by their by their by. Um, the words they use and their tone and uh, and so you know um, so I feel somewhat restrictive but I feel like it's sharpening my skill set as well as a listener um, so um, I, look, I look forward to the day to which I could return to the bedside um, but this is where we're at right now and uh, and we're uh, we're we're committed to this protocol as long as uh, leadership requires it, and we're going to certainly make the best of it uh, for the patient, the staff, and ourselves, for that matter. So, um, very good question. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, I find it interesting as to the um, challenges that you have when you're communicating with your patients. I've found that wearing a mask during my appointments with patients, it's been a challenge from the standpoint of making that connection. Um, mm. I really value kind of getting in close, really listening, showing them that I'm hearing, I'm, I'm here, I'm present for the conversation, but it's just something about wearing that mask that has become a barrier for that. And so mm. it's interesting how that's affecting different specialties uh, mm. now that we have the pandemic. Our next question is for Rabbi Stein. We are still learning about the pathophysiology of COVID-19. I would even argue that we are also learning about the emotional and spiritual impact of the COVID-19 pandemic. Please discuss from a spiritual perspective some of the common themes amongst patient, staff, or even healthcare providers that have arisen during the COVID-19 pandemic. Yeah, well, I think that COVID-19, like any crisis, throws people off balance. And that's a spiritual issue because part of spiritual health is being on balance and having a lot of balance in our lives. So the first thing that I just want to reassure people about the spiritual themes that are coming up is that they are normal. The things that have thrown us off balance are normal. And on a certain level, we do need to live into them and accept them as normal and not necessarily try to alter or change them. But having said that, when you're off balance, there are things that can balance out the scale. So I wanna to speak to those things as well. There's been a lot of sense of loneliness and isolation because in the hospital, the patients can't have any visitors and at home, people are sheltering in place. And so loneliness and isolation, those things are so normal and they do need to be accepted. But I think on the other side of the balance is recognizing and realizing that our families, our communities, our God is still there for us. We're not alone, even though we feel alone and isolated right now. There's a lot of grief and loss going on, uh, loss of health, loss of jobs, changes in how we do things and that's a loss too and again i think that people need to rest in that sense of loss and grief and accept that within themselves but a balance to that is a sense of gratitude and being aware of the things in our lives that we do have the things that we haven't lost covid19 has taken a lot from us but there are things it hasn't taken from us it hasn't taken away the beautiful weather and the springtime, the blossoms, everything outdoors. It hasn't taken away our love for each other and the ways that we're there for each other. Amongst staff in the hospital, I found people feeling very overwhelmed and sometimes so overwhelmed that they feel like they can't do their jobs. 
uh, just don't have the energy and the strength to do it anymore. And for that, I think sometimes people do need a break, but also they need to recognize that while it's important to do their work and their work and their jobs are important, it's not up to them to, to heal everything and to achieve everything. Some things are up to other people on the medical team. Sometimes it's important to go to another person who is in your same area of expertise and say, hey, I need a break, I need you to pick up here. And it's important to realize that they don't have to solve every problem, they can do only their part. And the rest is up to other people in their team and also up to God. Um, there's also a word that we use in the chaplain community called theodicy. And I know that's just a very big term, a fancy schmancy term that speaks to why does God let bad things happen to good people? And that's a question that just so many people have in many different circumstances. Why is this happening to me? All those big whys. And that would be a whole show to talk about that. Um, so I think it's just a matter right now of living into that mystery of why are things the way they are and uh, just finding our own individual responses to that and finding responses from our own church or synagogue or mosque or temple community. I think different religions have different approaches to that. Um, and lastly, there's a lot of sense that we're facing uncertainty. And things are uncertain. We need to accept that, that we don't know when this is gonna end. We don't know when there's going to be a cure or a vaccine and that sort of things. And for that, I think we do need to try to focus on the things that we're certain of. I'm certain of God's love and presence in my life, but many people might be certain of their family being there for them or just even of the sun coming up in the morning and the moon coming out at night. There are things that we can be certain of and to try to focus on those even amidst this uncertainty. That final comment was so very important. And another way that we might be able to think about it is the concept of checking the evidence, checking the evidence that God is still present in our lives. And that certainty that you talk about, I think, is a part of checking the evidence. So I definitely appreciate that perspective. So that brings us to our next concept of what many people, I'm sure, are dealing with at this time. Grief is a common theme that will inevitably arise from this pandemic. It may be grief related to loss of a loved one, it may be grief related to loss of a job or even grief related to the loss of the daily connection that we're all so accustomed to. What is a chaplain's perspective of grief? And how can we resurrect our spirit of hope when we are grieving? I would, as a chaplain, I would define grief as a deep, deep sorrow something that impacts the person. It could, it could have many dimensions. It could be spiritual. It could be emotional, physical, psychological. But it's something that really does impact their lives very deeply. And also, I, it, sometimes with grief, many times, it's very stifling because people, if they're not attended to soon enough or if they don't allow themselves to be open to being attended to, it really can stifle and change their life forever. People may have had a loss and for years they just have not been able to face the grief and sorrow that they feel. They've not had an opportunity or taken an opportunity to go professionally get help or even talk to a friend or a neighbor, pastor, or whatever it might be, whomever it might be. But it really is a sorrow that is just absolutely or can be debilitating. Uh, debilitating for people. We even have Elizabeth Kubler-Ross, who even has given us the stages of grief. And of course, now she's been around a long time, but even now people have uh, talked about that. They've added to, they've restructured that thought because she talks about the stages of grief, but many times grief has, doesn't have a stage. It, is, it happens different ways to different people. We all are human beings, we're fragile, we're unique. And so grief may have play out in many, many 
uh, times and in different ways. I know that even culturally, grief can play out and it can really, you can see grief, whether a patient, a family has just come in and a patient maybe has, has transitioned on. Culturally, they may, you know, have a certain way of, of being able to express their grief. It could be crying, it could be screaming, it could be saying nothing at all. It just really depends on a person and also where they are. And they also just uh, what they think and what they believe. But it definitely can be an, a process, a, 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 process, a process of feeling of great, great sorrow. And I think in terms of some strategies, I think of how we can resurrect, resurrect a hope, a spirit of hope through the grieving process. And I really believe that people have to be active because many times when we have maybe a person that has passed away, we're so stifled maybe by that transition, by that death, but it doesn't allow us for whatever reason to move on. It's not unusual, I know that probably Dave and Elena might be able to attest to this, but it's not unusual for me to have a patient that I'm talking to, maybe their wife died or their husband died 25 years ago, and they're still grieving. And I feel in that way, and they're still many times in their lives, they're still in the same place they were before their, their a husband or their wife or their family member passed away. They haven't had a time to really think about it and to be able, they haven't had a, an opportunity or haven't taken an opportunity to articulate it to someone. So I think that it's important that chaplains can resurrect a spirit of hope through their conversation, through their listening, to their learning of what they, do, what they can do for this patient. And many times as we listen as chaplains, comments can lead to other conversations and other healing processes. So chaplains are real important, but conversation is very important. It's important for a person that is grieving to open their heart and open their mind for us to be vulnerable and be able to tell people what we're feeling, not be embarrassed about it, just put it out there and be able to have someone to be able to embrace it. So it's really important during that time to resurrect that hope and also to really embrace people, really encourage them to depend on their higher power, for them to embrace, read scriptures, read, read whatever it is that they need to read in order to be encouraged. But we also want to encourage people in the grieving process to read books, articles, talk about those articles, to be able to be able to tell people through reading and learning about someone else's situation, or either it could be something medical. It could be something from a therapist, whatever it might be to do that. And also to seek professional help. We might need to find a professional that would be able to help them look beyond even what they spiritually need and be able to combine that with their healing. And then I think lastly that it's so important, I'm really a person that believes in positive thinking and visualization. They have to believe that there is going to be a time in their life where they're finally going to be able to reckon with what happened. I know initially they, that is just not possible in many cases, in many uh, people's lives. But eventually, if they talk to people, they're reading, they're listening, they're going to seminars, they're part of groups, they will finally, in some way, through their own belief system, they need to believe that it is going to be better at some time in your life. So when we're grieving, it's such a debilitating process. It's a necessary process, but also it's necessary for us to be able to move through our lives. Do we ever forget the people that we love? No, we don't forget them. We just have a different way of reckoning with it and honoring them through their legacy. But let's honor that legacy and be able to move forward with love and intention and a need. Mm -hmm. That's excellent. I I think the uh, important point that you brought across was the concept that grief is a necessary process. And I think if we all, even healthcare professionals, give ourselves permission to be vulnerable enough to experience the grief process and even share when we're, we're in need of help, I think that can help us for sure and help to resurrect our, our spirit of hope. Our next question is to Chaplain Dave. One of the most impactful consequences of the COVID-19 pandemic is that related to death. 
And many individuals have needed to die alone due to the risk of infecting others with COVID-19. Chaplain Dave, what words of comfort do you have for those who have had loved ones die alone? Well, um, having recently experienced this in, in uh, just the other day, in fact, um, having some time with a patient that was, um, was dying without their family at bedside. I could assure you from um, my experience and um, our hospital and in, in speaking to our nurses, our, our patients don't die alone. They are under the care and the love of uh, of the nurse and their doctors and so uh, someone is there with them it's certainly not preferred at all and I think uh, that the not preferred aspect to this adds a complicated dimension to the grief uh, because um, it's been my experience in, in, in my reading as well that it, there's something of value for the family to be present when their loved, loved one passes on. But in this case, under the COVID-19 uh, COVID pandemic and experience, um, in, in the current protocols of various hospitals, uh, families just can't be at the bedside um, with their loved one and they experience that death together. Um, they have to, the experience is now a more of, of distance. And uh, um, so that makes, that complicates their grieving process uh, uh, more so. Um, but in the time of this loss uh, that I was able to minister to just the other day, I had the nurse, uh, um, identified the fact that this this patient that I uh, that was dying had a, uh, a spiritual religious tradition and she honored that of the patient who at the time was unconscious and asked me to pray with the patient with the telephone to the patient's ear uh, I had time a moment of prayer for with the patient and then I had time with the staff member and, and the nurse and asking the nurse, how are you experiencing this? And then after that, uh, sharing some time uh, with her in this case, uh, she, uh, we, we spoke together about what the family needs might be. And uh, she provided me with a, with a, a phone number of, uh, of a family member. In this case, it was the patient's uh, sister to which then I made that phone call to her and we spoke at length and prayer was asked for and provided then as well. Um, so uh, this whole new approach to spiritual care by phone and in the context of, of death is certainly is um, you know, made things a bit more complicated, but I, I think the, the all good intentions of supporting the patient, supporting the family uh, in the time of, uh, of grief and death um, really doesn't change. Uh, I, I, at least I'm, I think we're all committed to that is how can we express that, um, that love to which uh, Chaplain Michelle spoke of earlier? How can we express that kind of compassion and, and love to the other by by phone, and um, and sometimes uh, you know the the nurses oftentimes are still ex still expressing that. Um, hence, why they are um, uh, are being stressed um, because they're they're putting forth m more of themselves, not just the medical knowledge and 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 the um, skills. But they're putting more of themselves into their care, knowing their patient is not receiving the normal visitations that they may have if with if if this COVID uh, nineteen was not around. So 
nurses are putting nurses and doctors are putting more of themselves out in, um, in a sense of greater vulnerability to to express that sense of care and love and um, and so this is how I would ensure the the, the family if, if if a family member came to to me and said uh, you know, I'm I'm concerned that my my loved one is dying alone, and I would assure them that under our care, they are being cared for, um, and and they're being um, supported the best way we can. Uh, the, certainly, um, is I would say through my tradition, the uh, the doctors and nurses are the feet of God. Uh, they are providing the extension of love and care and compassion. And they're going to they're going to be there um, for your loved one in, in the course of their passing, um, and the chaplains as well. We're going to do what we can by phone, uh, and we're going to continue to do that. We're very committed to doing that. So, as uh, as difficult as this may be uh, for for all of us, we're going to still put forth that uh, sense of compassion and love for the other. Um, um, uh, through, during this time um, of greater complication uh, uh, around um, death and grief. Um, it's uh, certainly not an easy time in, uh, uh, at all, and, um, and uh, my heart breaks when I, when I hear some of the other stories from the other cities that are being more so affected than, say, our city is. Uh, so, um, uh, but nonetheless, uh, we're committed to the care and um and uh um it's 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 certainly a, not an easy question dr lane but it's it's uh, it's something that we have we have to face each day and be prepared to face uh each day as uh in our roles whether we're chaplains or doctors and nurses when we when we're caring for the for the patient we we, we, we will experience death and we're going to be in, in a role of, of ministry um, uh, to, to that effect. Um, uh, so, uh, you know, it's, um, you know, it's, it's my continued prayer every day. I, I think of my, my units um, that I care for and I, I miss them. I know they're, they're, they're enduring a lot, um, but I remain uh, available to them as we all are. Uh, and, uh, as we support one another through this through this uh, pandemic. Chaplain Dave, your response was such a compassionate response and approach to um, a very difficult time. Mm -hmm. I think it really highlighted the importance and the significance of everyone that is on the team. Mm -hmm. And when I reflect back on the encouragement to pause, Sometimes when we pause, it does allow us to step back and see something different and have a fresh perspective. And I think a nurse that would call you and ask you to speak with a patient with their phone to the ear is a nurse who has paused for a moment and reflected on what she may even want to experience for herself or a family member. So that whole concept of, of the amount of support that's surrounding a patient at the time of death is a very important perspective. So I appreciate you for, for putting that uh, in the forefront. That's excellent. Thank you. Well, this has been Dr. Antherica Lane with Conversations with Dr. Lane. We have been having a wonderful conversation with the chaplains of Jewish Hospital Mercy Health, which is a part of Bond Secures. We have had Chaplain Dr. Lachelle Edmerson. We have had Reverend Chaplain Dave Ebacher, and we have also had Rabbi Chaplain Elena Stein. In the spirit of spiritual care, I would like Rabbi Stein to end our interview with a blessing. Source of meaning and hope. Fill my soul with the enormity of your love and give your love to all those who are watching this program today. Bless Dr. Lane and her commitment to enhancing the lives of others. Bless chaplains Dave, Lachelle, and myself with opportunities to be present to others who are in need. 
Bless all of those first responders and hospital workers, their patients and their families. As the physical distance between my brothers and sisters increases, may the spiritual distance between us and our source decrease. When we cannot hold hands in earnest, may our hearts be bound together in a spirit of solidarity and love. When we cannot congregate in public, help us to find community and shared purpose. When the spread of disease threatens our safety, may we spread kindness, hope, and a sense of security to all who are vulnerable and alone. When illness occupies our minds, may our souls be filled with a vision of healing. When a cure feels out of reach, may we always have faith in you who heal us in body and in spirit. Amen. Amen. This has been Dr. Antherica Lane with Conversations with Dr. Lane.